Thank you, uh, Professor Sheikh Chaudhary, and uh, sorry to everyone again for having kept you waiting. Even though I've lived in Calcutta for a few years, uh, uh, I, I constantly underestimate the wonderful traffic in this city. And uh, we had uh, a function in Salt Lake from which we are coming, and it took a good deal longer than we had uh, hoped or planned. So my apologies. I'm glad to see you all here patiently, and I'll try and um, I'll try and uh, I hope make the wait worthwhile. But I do want to thank uh, Professor Sheikh Ashwadi for his very uh, elaborate introduction. It was apparent to me within a couple of sentences that he had, he or somebody on his staff had done that terrible thing they had looked me up on the internet. Uh, this is one of the great dangers when you come to a, when you come to a place like that. I must say, I, I say this in, in no spirit of criticism, I do the same thing when I have to introduce a speaker. But the fact is that, you know, uh, uh, one always worries about whether they may find things on the internet that you haven't actually done and proudly introduce you by it, uh, which has happened to people I know. Uh, in this particular instance, however, I'm very pleased to say that uh, uh, everything Professor Chaudhary said, as far as I know, was accurate. Uh, <laughs> at least there was, there, there, there was uh, nothing that I could particularly uh, consciously object to, but I will say that there were some things on it that could have been on it that he very graciously left out. Uh, for example, you notice that he said I was Minister of State for External Affairs. He never said I actually resigned uh, a year later. But this is the joy of introductions. You always put a positive gloss on everything. And I had a friend in, uh, in New York who liked introducing people, not only by things they'd actually done, but by actions of their parents, their grandparents, uncles and aunts, you know, sins of omission and commission up the family tree. And at one point he found he was going to introduce a speaker whose uncle had been electrocuted at Sing Sing prison for kidnapping and armed robbery or something equally horrible. But having taken the trouble to look this up, he felt he had to use it. So he said, uh, our distinguished speaker had an uncle who occupied the chair of applied electricity at one of the nation's leading institutions. just by way of saying that these kind introductions should be taken with a generous pinch of salt. But thank you, nonetheless, and it does give me a lot of pleasure to be with you all this afternoon. Uh, the topic that was suggested was who is an Indian, and I must say that uh, one thinks back inevitably to midnight on August 15th, 1947, when our country in its present form was born, independent India, as Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru proclaimed in words that so many of you must have learned at school, certainly I did, a tryst with destiny, a moment which comes but rarely in history, when we pass from the old to the new, when an age ends and when the soul of a nation, long suppressed, finds utterance." Unquote. Great lines, uh, and these are the words with which he launched India on a remarkable experiment in governance, in some ways remarkable because it was happening at all. India, Winston Churchill had once barked, is merely a geographical expression. It is no more a single country than the equator. Well, Churchill was rarely right about India. Uh, but it is true that no other country in the world embraces the extraordinary mixture of ethnic groups, the profusion of mutually incomprehensible languages, the varieties of topography and climate, the diversity of religious and cultural practices, and the range of levels of economic development that India does. And yet India is more than the sum of its contradictions. Just thinking about our country, about who is an Indian, makes clear the immensity of the challenge of defining what it means to be an Indian. How can one approach this land of snow peaks and tropical jungles with 23 major languages and 22,000 distinct dialects, including some spoken by more people than speak Danish or Norwegian, but which are still not listed in the official schedule of the Constitution, inhabited in the second decade of the 21st century by 1.2 billion individuals, if our census got it right, of every ethnic extraction known to humanity? How does one come to terms with a country whose population is nearly 40% illiterate, but which has educated the world's second largest pool of trained scientists and engineers? A country whose teeming cities overflow while two out of three Indians still scratch a living from the soil? What is the clue to understanding Indianness when it's a country that's still rife with despair and disrepair, 
which nonetheless had moved a Mughal emperor to declaim, if on earth there be paradise of bliss, it is this, it is this, it is this. How does one gauge a culture which elevated nonviolence to an effective moral principle, but whose freedom was born in blood and his independence still soaks in it? How does one explain a land where peasant organizations and suspicious officials once attempted to close down Kentucky Fried Chicken as a threat to the nation? You were too young to know about that, but that happened in Bangalore in the mid-1990s. A country where a former prime minister once bitterly criticized the sale of Pepsi-Cola in a land where villagers don't yet have clean drinking water. And yet this same country invents more sophisticated software for American computer manufacturers than any other country in the world. How can one determine the future, let alone the character of an ageless civilization that was the birthplace of four major religions, a dozen different traditions of classical dance, 85 major political parties of which 44 are officially recognized by the election commission, and 300 ways of cooking the potato? <laughs> Short answer is that it can't be done at least not to everyone's satisfaction. Any truism about India can be immediately contradicted by another truism about India. It is often jokingly said that anything you can say about India, the opposite is also true. Our country's national motto, emblazoned on our governmental crest, is Satyame Vajayate, truth alone triumphs. The question remains, however, whose truth? It is a question to which there are at least 1.2 billion answers assuming, as I said, that our census hasn't undercounted us again. But that sort of an answer is no answer at all, and so another answer to this question of who is an Indian has to be sought. And this may lie in a simple insight, that the singular thing about India is that you can only speak of it in the plural. There are, in the hackneyed phrase, many Indians. Some of you who may have taken the GMAT may also be familiar with the American motto, e pluribus unum, out of many, one. If we had to borrow it in India, we'd have to change the dog Latin to e pluribus pluribum, out of many, many, because that's who we are and that's how we remain. Everything exists in countless variants. There is no single standard, no fixed stereotype, no one way of doing things. Our pluralism is acknowledged in the way in which India arranges its own affairs. All groups, all faiths, tastes, ideologies survive and contend for their place in the sun. At a time when most developing countries opted for authoritarian models of government to promote nation building and to direct development, India chose to be a multi-party democracy. And despite many stresses and strains, including 22 months of autocratic rule when Mrs. Indira Gandhi declared an emergency in 1975, despite all of that, a multi-party democracy, freewheeling, rumbustious, corrupt and inefficient perhaps, but nonetheless flourishing, India has remained. Now, one result, of course, is that India strikes many as maddening, chaotic, inefficient, and seemingly unpurposeful as we muddle our way through the second decade of the 21st century. Another, though, is that India is not just a country. It's an adventure, one in which all avenues are open and where everything is possible. India, wrote the British historian E.P. Thompson, is perhaps the most important country for the future of the world. All the convergent influences of the world, Thompson wrote, run through this society. There is not a thought that is being thought in the West or the East that is not active in some Indian mind. Now, I'm glad a Brit said that and not an Indian. But the fact is that Indian mind has been shaped by remarkably diverse forces. Ancient Hindu tradition, myth and scripture, the impact of Islam and Christianity, and two centuries of British colonial rule. The result is unique. Many observers have been astonished by India's survival as a pluralist state. But India could hardly have survived as anything else. Pluralism is a reality that emerges from the very nature of our country. It's a choice made inevitable by India's geography and reaffirmed by its history. And that leads to the answer of the question, who is an Indian? Because India's is a civilization that over millennia has offered refuge and more important religious and cultural freedom to Jews, to Parsis, several varieties of Christians, and of course to Muslims. Jews came to my home state of Kerala centuries before Christ. 
with the destruction by the Babylonians of their first temple. And what is striking, they were the only Jew Jewish diaspora in the world that knew not a single instance of anti-Semitism. There was no persecution of the Jews on Indian soil until the Portuguese arrived in the 16th century and inflicted it. Christianity also arrived in, on Indian soil in Kerala with St. Thomas the Apostle, doubting Thomas of the, of the Bible, who came to the coast of India sometime around 52 AD and it is said was welcomed on shore by a flute playing Jewish girl. He made many converts and so I can tell European or American audiences today that there are Indians in my home state whose ancestors were Christian long before any European had ever discovered Christianity. What about the Parsis? One of my favorite stories of Indian assimilation is not to India's credit particularly, but to the Parsis when they showed up off the coast of Gujarat in a large ship. The, the tale is told that the local Gujarati king felt that he had more than enough people to deal with. So he sent an envoy to tell them to buzz off. But of course, uh, they had no language in common. So to explain what the problem was, the envoy summoned a glass of water and dropped a stone in it. And of course, the water overflowed from the tumbler to show there's no room for you. You see, you may full up. But the Parsi captain had a better idea. He stopped the envoy, summoned a tumbler of milk, and carefully stirred a spoonful of sugar into the milk. The milk did not spill, it was sweetened. And that, he said, would be what the Parsis would do if they were embraced in India. It's a wonderful story, but our country is full of these stories. It's the, the mixture of civilizations. Islam, I know in North India, came uh, initially through the sword. In the South, it came through travelers. It came peacefully. Uh, in fact, um, in, in parts of, um, in parts of, uh, of Kerala, there's an area called uh, Koyikod, Calicut, where the Zamorin, the local ruler, was so impressed by the seafaring skills of, of, of the Muslim community, the Kunyali Marikars, as they were called, that he actually decreed that every fisherman's family in his domain would bring up one son as a Muslim to man his, his navy because he felt only Muslims knew how to sail. So he had an all-Muslim navy and he was a Hindu king. See, this, this, is, this is India. And this heritage of diversity means that in the Kolkata neighborhood where I grew up in my high school years, um, an hour and a half's traffic away from here, uh, the wail of the muezzin calling the Islamic faithful to prayer used to routinely blend with the chant of the mantras and the tinkling of bells at the local Shiva temple, accompanied just down the road by the Sikh Gurdwara reading verses through their loudspeaker from the Guru Granth Sahib, and just around the corner was St. Paul's Cathedral. That is Calcutta, and that is India. So the first challenge in answering the question before us today of who is an Indian is that we cannot generalize about India. In fact, one of the few generalizations you can safely make about India is that nothing can be taken for granted about our country, not even its name. For the name India comes from the river Indus, which flows in Pakistan. <laughs> well, we all know, of course, how that anomaly arose since what is today Pakistan was uh, hacked off the stooped shoulders of India by the departing British in 1947. But each explanation breeds another anomaly because Pakistan was ostensibly created as a homeland for India's Muslims. But at least until very recently, if the demographic figures are right, there were more Muslims in India than in Pakistan. So then, how do we answer this question? In nearly six and a half decades after independence, many thoughtful observers have seen a country that's more conscious than ever of what divides it. Religion, region, caste, language, ethnicity. What makes India then a nation? To answer that, I'd like to take an Italian example. Not that Italian example. <laughs> Amidst the popular ferment that created an Italian nation out of a mosaic of principalities and statelets in the late 19th century, one Italian nationalist Massimo Taparelli D'Azeglio, for the more pedantic amongst you, memorably wrote, we have created Italy. Now all we need to do is to create Italians. Now oddly enough, no Indian nationalists have come to the temptation to express the same thought. No one said, you know, we've created India, now we need to create Indians. Because for people like Nehru and the other nationalist leaders, 
they believed in the existence of India and Indians for millennia before their nationalist struggle had given contemporary political expression to this identity. Nehru would never have spoken of creating India or Indians, merely of being the agent for the reassertion of what had always existed but had been long suppressed. Nonetheless, the India that was born in 1947 was, in a very real sense, a new creation. A state that had made fellow citizens out of the Ladakhi and the Lakhidivian for the first time, that divided Punjabi from Punjabi for the first time, that asked the Keralite peasant to feel allegiance to a Kashmiri Pandit ruling in Delhi also for the first time. So Nehru would not have written of the challenge of creating Indians, but creating Indians was what, in fact, the nationalist movement did. Now let's illustrate what this means with a simple story. When we celebrated the 49th anniversary of our independence from British rule in 1996, our then Prime Minister was H.D. Devagauda, as you all know, from the state of Karnataka. And he stood at the ramparts of the Lal Kila, the Red Fort in Delhi, and delivered the traditional Independence Day address to the nation in Hindi, hmm? which all of us tend to call, though the Constitution doesn't have this expression, India's national language. Eight other Prime Ministers had done the same thing 48 times before him. But what was unusual this time was that Devagauda spoke to the nation in a language of which he did not know a word. Tradition and politics demanded a speech in Hindi. So he gave one. But the words had been written out for him in his native Kannada script, in which, of course, they made no sense. Now, such an episode is almost inconceivable anywhere else in the world. But it represents the best of the oddities that helped make India, India. Only in India can, a, can the country, can you imagine a country being ruled by a man who doesn't understand its so-called national language? Only in India, for that matter, is there a national language which half the population cannot understand. But only in India could this particular solution have been found to enable the Prime Minister to address his people. You know, one of our finest playback singers, uh, at least in Hindi cinema in the 1980s, in Malayalam cinema almost forever, K.J. Yesudas, actually sang his way to the top of the Bollywood film charts in the 1980s in a number of Hindi songs. And I actually caught a glimpse of his songbook. He had written out the lyrics in the Malayalam script to sing. Now, you can accept that from a playback singer, but to see this practice being elevated to the Prime Ministerial Address on Independence Day is an astonishing affirmation of Indian pluralism. For you see, we are all minorities in India. A typical Indian stepping off a train, let's say a Hindi-speaking Hindu male from Uttar Pradesh, right? I might cherish the illusion that he represents the majority community, to use an expression much favored by the less industrious of our journalists. But he does not. Yes, as a Hindu, he belongs to the faith adhered to by some 81% of the population, but a majority of the country, or a bare majority, manages to speak Hindi. But a majority, in any case, does not hail from Uttar Pradesh, even if it sometimes feels like that when you go there. And if he were visiting, say, Kerala, he would discover that a majority there is not even male. <laughs> worse, worse, this archetypal UP Hindu has only got to mix with the multilingual, multicolored crowds thronging the railway station, and I'm referring to the color of their skins, not the color of their clothes, to realize how much of a minority he really is. Even as Hinduism is no guarantee of majorityhood, because his caste automatically places him in a minority as well. If he's a Brahmin, well, 90% of his fellow Indians are not. If he's a Yadav, a backward class, or whatever, an OBC, well, 85% of Indians are not Yadavs, and so on. I mean, you can slice, slice it any way you like. Or take language. The Constitution of India, as you know, now recognizes 23 today. You take out your rupee note uh, and, and you find how many scripts on it, 14 or 15 scripts uh, on, on the note. There are, in fact, 35 Indian languages that are spoken by more than a million people each. And these are languages, okay, with their own scripts, grammatical structures, and cultural assumptions. And then, as I said, if you count dialects, you get to the 22,000 or something. Each of the native speakers of each of these languages is in a linguistic minority, for none truly enjoys majority status in India. Thanks in part to the popularity of Bollywood, yes, Hindi is, I guess, understood, uh, if not always well spoken, by, by about half the population of India. 
but it's in no sense the language of the majority because its locutions, its gender rules, its script are unfamiliar to most Indians in the south or the northeast. Then take ethnicity. Ethnicity further complicates the notion of a majority community. Most of the time, an Indian's name immediately reveals where he's from, what his mother tongue is. When we introduce ourselves, we are advertising our origins. Despite some intermarriage at the elite levels in our cities, Indians still largely remain endogamous. I think the statistic is something like 95% of Indian marriages are still within the same ethnic group, uh, uh, endogamous marriages. So a Bengali, as a result, is pretty easily distinguished from a Punjabi. And the difference this reflects is often more apparent than the elements of commonality. So a Karnatic Brahmin can share his Hindu faith with a Bihari Kurmi, but they feel little identity with each other in respect of appearance, dress, customs, taste, language, or these days their political objectives. At the same time, a Tamil Hindu would feel he has far more in common with a Tamil Christian or a Tamil Muslim than with, say, a Haryan Vijat, with whom, of course, he shares a religion. So why do I harp on these differences? Only to make the point that Indian nationalism is a very rare animal indeed. In fact, talking about it reminds me of the story of the American and the French diplomat arguing about a problem at the UN Security Council. And the American says, you know how we can solve this? We can do this and this and this and we can solve it. And the French diplomat says, yes, that will work in practice. But will it work in theory? <laughs> Sounds like an I am professor or two, right? Yeah. <laughs> the fact is that Indian nationalism has worked in practice, 64 years in country, but it doesn't actually hand, uh, stand up in theory, because in any of the classic theories of what makes a nation, ours is not based on language, as I said, we have at least 23 or 35, depending on whether you follow the constitution or the ethno-linguist. It's not based on geography, because the natural geography of the subcontinent framed by the mountains and the sea was hacked by the partition of 47. It's not based on ethnicity because the Indian accommodates such a diversity of ethnic types or racial types, but also because Indians have ethnically more in common with certain foreigners than with other Indians. For example, Indian Punjabis and Bengalis are ethnically kin to and have more in common with Pakistanis and Bangladeshis than they have with Punawalas and Bangaloreans, respectively. And, of course, it's not based on religion, because we are home to every faith known to mankind, with the possible exception of Shintoism, though even that allegedly has some Vedic elements. And, and Hinduism, which is a faith without a national organization, no established church or ecclesiastical hierarchy, no Hindu pope, no specific Hindu mecca, no single holy book, no uniform beliefs or modes of worship, actually epitomizes our diversity, exemplifies our common cultural heritage uh, in, in ways that make it quite unique, but which certainly doesn't explain Indian nationhood. So no, Indian nationalism is the nationalism of an idea. The idea of an ever-ever land emerging from an ancient civilization, united by a shared history and sustained by pluralist democracy. This land, this idea, it was, it was actually Tagore's phrase that Amartya Sen subsequently recycled, has got new currency now, the idea of India, imposes no new or narrow conformities on its citizens. The whole point about being Indian is that you can be many things and one thing. You can be a good Muslim, a good Keralite, and a good Indian all at once. When I was at the UN handling the former Yugoslavia, I was struck by the horrors being inflicted on each other by these groups uh, who were all descended from the same Slavic tribes that had settled the Balkan Peninsula in the 7th century AD. Often had similar surnames, looked alike, but because of history and circumstance, one was uh, Orthodox Church, one was the Roman Catholic Church, one had been ruled by the Austro-Hungarian Empire, one had been ruled by the Ottoman Empire, one had been independent. All of these aspects of history and politics meant that they started butchering each other. And the Freudian expression, the narcissism of minor differences, was, was brought up to explain what was happening in Yugoslavia. Well, in India, we don't have the narcissism of minor differences. We have the commonality of major differences. And that is our great strength. To stand Michael Ignatieff's famous phrase on its head, we are a land of belonging rather than of blood. So the idea of India is a one land embracing many. 
It's the idea that a nation may endure differences of caste, creed, color, culture, cuisine, conviction, costume, and custom, and still rally around a consensus. And that consensus is around the simple democratic principle that in a diverse and rich democracy like ours, you don't really need to agree all the time, so long as you would agree on the ground rules of how you will disagree. The reason that India has survived all the stresses and strains that have beset it for 65 years, and that led so many to predict even our country's disintegration, is that we maintain consensus on how to manage without consensus. My generation, you see, grew up in an India where our sense of nationhood lay in the slogan, unity in diversity. We were brought up to take our pluralism for granted and to reject the communalism that had partitioned the nation when the British left. In rejecting the case for Pakistan, Indian nationalism also rejected the very idea that religion should be a determinant of nationhood. We never fell into the insidious trap of agreeing that since partition had established a state for Muslims, what remained was a state for Hindus. To accept the idea of India, you had to spurn the logic that had divided the country. We had to be a state for all who sought to belong to it. And this is what that much abused term secularism meant for us. Western dictionaries define secularism as the absence of religion. But Indian secularism means a profusion of religions. The state engaged with them all, but privileged none. Secularism, in any case, in our country, cannot mean irreligiousness. Because even avowedly atheist parties like the Communists or the DMK party in the South, who have officially adopted atheism in their platform, have found this plank unpopular with their voters. Indeed, in Kolkata's annual Durga Puja, at least when I was growing up here, the, uh, the youth wings of the Communist parties would compete with each other to put up the most lavish puja pandals. Uh, and, and in fact, um, uh, what it really has always meant is that as I described the neighborhood that I lived in, it's always meant that all religions flourish. I tried to explain to the French when they started banning overt symbols of religion that I went to school with people wearing everything, you know, turbans and crosses and, and various signs of their faith. Uh, and it didn't bother anybody because we simply grew up accepting all of this around us. And throughout the decades after independence, at least the first four decades, which I can speak of with personal authority, uh, the political culture of our country always reflected these assumptions. You know, Though the population was overwhelmingly Hindu, though the country had been partitioned as a result of a demand for a separate Muslim homeland, three of India's presidents have been Muslims, also innumerable governors, cabinet ministers, chief ministers, ambassadors, generals, Supreme Court justices, and chief justices. In fact, during the war with Pakistan in 1971, the Indian Air Force in the northern sector was commanded by a Muslim officer. Air Marshal, later Air Chief Marshal Latif. The Army Commander was a Parsi, General Manikshaw, later Field Marshal Manikshaw. The General Officer, based in Fort William here in Kolkata, commanding the forces that marched into Bangladesh, was a Sikh, General Arora. And the General who was helicoptered in to negotiate the terms of surrender of the Pakistani forces in East Bengal was Jewish, General Jacob. That is India. So, this is the, 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 the story that uh, uh, I wanted to describe in answering this question. But I should accept at the very beginning that in talking about India in this way, I open myself up to certain kinds of misunderstandings. But then misunderstandings exist in every domain. In fact, as an Indian who lived in America for some years, let me tell you my favorite story of Indian-American misunderstanding, uh, which is when, before our Green Revolution, the Americans used to send agricultural experts here to advise us on farming. And the story is of this uh, USAID expert who lands up at an Indian farm, you know, uh, in the early 60s. And thanks to our population pressures and our land reforms, the farm isn't very big, maybe not much larger than this auditorium we're in. But the, um, the farmer is very proud of his land and he says to the, to the American, welcome to my land. He says, all oh, this is my land. The American looks, he doesn't see very much here, but the Indian says, you see that uh, national highway? And the American looks, he sees a dirt road. The American says, my land goes all the way up to there. And he says, you see that, that irrigation canal? And the American looks, he sees a trickle of water. But the Indian says proudly, my land goes all the way up to there. And then he says, what about you? Well, the American is a farmer from Kansas, or one of these Midwestern prairie states, where the wheat fields roll on for miles on end. 
So he clears his throat and says, well, I get into my tractor in the morning and I drive three hours south to the southern boundary of my land. And then it's another two hours in my tractor to the western boundary of my land. Then I break for a sandwich. He says, then I take another one and a half hours in my tractor to the northern boundary of my land. In my tractor, what, about two hours to the eastern boundary of my land? And finally, it's sundown. It takes me another hour to drive back in my tractor to my ranch house. He finds the Indian nodding very sympathetically. I know, I know, says the Indian farmer. I too used to have a tractor like that. <laughs> the point of that story, just to make sure, other than trying to make sure that you guys were still awake, can't really see you with the lights in my eyes, is to stress that, um, that what you understand always depends on what your assumptions are. And what I have laid out for you today in answering the question, who is an Indian, are my assumptions. I have to accept that there are others who don't share those assumptions and not all agree with this vision of India. There are those who wanted to become a Hindu Rashtra, a land often for the Hindu majority, and they've made some gains in the elections of the last 20 years. Secularism is established in our constitution, but they ask why India should not, like many other developing countries, find refuge in the, research, in the assertion of its own religious identity. Well, I think I've probably written a, a lot about this, and I won't belabor the point, but I, uh, I have two uh, answers to give uh, from a, a personal anecdotal point of view. My wife is sitting here. She's, um, she's from Kashmir. She's somebody who's um, had to endure various experiences uh, in her home state, including having her ancestral home burned down by... Islamist terrorists. Uh, it has not created any rancor in her, any feeling uh, against a particular community, others of that faith. We have friends from everywhere. And as a Kashmiri, she has married me, a Keralite, whose constituency, we can't say Kashmir to Kanyakumari, because Kanyakumari was given away in 1956 to the state of Tamil Nadu, but we can say Kashmir to Kolam, and we have that uh, in, our, in our background. Uh, a different example, perhaps, of the next generation closer to yours, my twin sons were born in June 84. And though they first entered the world in Singapore, uh, and though the circumstances of my life saw them grow up in Switzerland and then the US, uh, they lived in Hong Kong and London and they're now in New York, it's India they've always identified with. You ask them what they are and that's what they'll tell you, they're Indian. They're, they're not Hindu, they're not Malayali, they're not Naya, they're not Calcutta, though they could lay claim to all those labels too. Their mother is half Bengali, half Kashmiri, which gives them further permutative possibilities, but they desire none. They are just Indian. Now, we all know that in recent years, they and all of us have seen an India in which that answer no longer seems enough. We've seen the violence of the Babri Masjid, we've seen what happened in Gujarat when perhaps 2,000 people were killed uh, because uh, of the mark on a forehead or the absence of a foreskin. This is not the kind of India that I would like you young people to grow up to and inherit. And I say this as someone who considers himself very much a believing Hindu. To me, the pluralist traditions of India have been made possible by the fact that the overwhelming majority of Indians are Hindus. It's very odd to read of Hindu fundamentalism because Hinduism is a religion without fundamentals. There is no organized church, as I said, no compulsory beliefs or rites of worship. Even the name denotes something both less and more than a set of theological beliefs. In many languages, French and Persian are two that I know of, the name for Indian is Hindu. They don't draw a distinction. Originally, Hindu simply meant the people uh, beyond the river Sindhu or Indus. But the Indus, of course, is now in Islamic Pakistan. And to make matters worse, the word Hindu did not exist in any Indian language until its use by foreigners gave Indians or Indian Hindus, a term for self-definition. So Hinduism is the name others apply to the indigenous religion of India, which many simply prefer to call Sanatana Dharma. It embraces an eclectic range of doctrines and practices, from pantheism to agnosticism, and from faith and reincarnation to belief in the caste system. But none of these constitutes an obligatory credo for a Hindu. There are none. We have no compulsory dogmas. I grew up in a Hindu household. Our home always had a prayer room. It still does. As a child, I remember paintings and portraits of uh, assorted divinities would jostle for shelf space and wall space 
with fading photographs of departed ancestors, all stained by ash scattered by the, the agarbatis lit by my devout parents. Every morning after his bath, my father would stand in front of the prayer room wrapped in his towel, his wet hair still uncombed, and chant his Sanskrit mantras. But he never obliged me to join him. He exemplified the Hindu idea that religion is an intensely personal matter, that prayer is between you and whatever image of your maker you choose to worship. In the Indian way, he wanted me to find my own truth. And I think I have. I am a believer, despite a brief period of schoolboy atheism, of the kind that comes with the discovery of rationality and goes with an acknowledgement of its limitations. And for me, it's not just a question of the faith into which I was born, the string of other reasons, though faith, of course, requires no reason. Uh, one is cultural. I, as a Hindu, I belong to a faith that expresses the ancient genius of my own people. Uh, in some ways, it's also the question of the intellectual fit, because I'm more comfortable with the belief structures of Hinduism than I would be with those of the other faiths of which I know, and there's no judgment implied. It's simply that as a Hindu, I claim adherence to a religion which has so few uh, compuls compulsions to impose upon its people, a religion that doesn't even oblige me to demonstrate my faith by any visible sign, by any compulsory rituals, by subsuming my identity in any collectivity, not even by a specific day or time or frequency of worship. In other words, a faith that is free of the restrictive dogmas of holy writ, that refuses to be shackled to the limitations of any single holy book. And above all, a faith which says, Perhaps it's the only major religion in the world that doesn't claim to be the only true religion in the world. I actually find it immensely congenial to be able to face my fellow human beings of other faiths without being burdened by the conviction that I'm embarked upon a true path that they have somehow missed. <laughs> Hinduism asserts that all ways of belief are equally valid, and Hindus readily venerate the saints and the sacred objects of other faiths. My wife, uh, for example, insisted we go to to uh, to, to to Ajmer Chishti to to to, to uh, lay a chadar there at the shrine of the of the Sufi saint. This is this is very much part of the Hindu tradition, and the reason is in many ways that Hinduism is a civilization, not a dogma. There is no such thing as a Hindu heresy. So how can people, in the name of this faith, how can this faith be? Argued, uh, argued as, as, as representing a set of, set of fundamentals that excludes others. This is a faith that embraces everyone. And in the name of this faith, to try and promote a narrower version of Indian identity is to me completely unforgivable. The pluralism of Indianness is also present in the pluralism of Hinduism. And therefore, any argument that suggests that an Indian identity can only be anchored in the Hindu faith is actually a betrayal of Hinduism itself, as I understand it, and as I see so many Hindus around me, from my wife to my, from my father to my wife, and, and to the friends I have around me, the way in which they practice this faith. Basically, the Hinduism that I know understands that faith is a matter of hearts and minds, not of bricks and stone. Build Ram in your heart, the Hindu is enjoined, and if Ram is in your heart, it will little matter where else he is or is not. So the politics of deprivation has eroded our culture's confidence because Hindu chauvinism has emerged from the competition for resources in a contentious democracy. Politicians of all faiths across India have sought to mobilize voters by appealing to narrower and narrower identities, by seeking votes in the name of religion, of caste, of region, they have urged voters to define themselves on these lines. And as religion and caste and region and language have become the important thing in public discourse, it becomes more important to be a Muslim, a Bodo, a Tamu, a Yadav, than to be simply an Indian. That is what we must change. So for me, there is no such thing as a particularly authentic Indian. We are all authentic Indians. To my mind, if we keep trying to assault other people in the name of some pure identity, we are simply ensuring that we are spawning new hostages to history, ensuring that future generations will be taught new wrongs to set right. We live, Octavio Paz once wrote, between oblivion and memory. Memory and oblivion, how one leads to the other and back again 
has been the concern of much of my writing, particularly in my fiction. As I pointed out in the last words of my novel, Riot, history is not a web woven with innocent hands. So let us not get to the notion that we can reduce non-Hindus, for example, to second-class status in their own homeland. That would be a different kind of partition, a second partition. Far worse than the partition in the Indian soil, it would be a partition of the Indian soul. For me, the only possible idea of India is of a nation greater than the sum of its parts. That is the only India that will allow each of us to call ourselves Indian. And so the Indian identity that I want to celebrate today when I answer the question of who is an Indian is an identity that celebrates diversity. I used to tell American audiences, you guys might be a melting pot. We're not. You know, we, we don't melt all our identities together into one as they do in America. We are, in fact, a thali, because we're a collection of different dishes on one stainless steel plate. Each dish tastes different. It, because it's in a different bowl, it doesn't flow into the next, but it belongs together on that same one plate, and it combines on your palate to give you a satisfying repast. That is the India that answers the question. You hear of the American dream, well, if there is an Indian dream, it is a dream that can be dreamt in Gujarati or in Tamil, that can be dreamt by a Muslim or a Parsi, that can be dreamt by a Brahmin or a Bodo, dreamt on a charpoy or on a luxury king bed. India's founding fathers wrote a constitution for their dreams. We have given passports to their ideals. Any narrower definition of Indianness would not just be pernicious, it would be an insult to Indian nationhood. An India that denies itself to some Indians would no longer be the India that Mahatma Gandhi fought to free. So that is my answer to the question of who is an Indian. But since I'm also a novelist, I can't resist the temptation to end with a story, but not one of my own stories. It's a story from our Puranas, the story of a sage and his disciples. It's a story of um, a typical Indian story where the, the sage asks his disciples, Tell me, when does the night end? And the disciples say, well, of course, at dawn. And the says, I know that. But when does the night end and the dawn begin? And the first disciple who's from my part of India, hot and tropical Kerala, says, oh, I know, I know. He says, it's when the first streaks of sunlight shine on the palm fronds of the coconut trees, swaying gently in the breeze above the paddy fields. That is when the night ends and the dawn begins. Say, says, no, my son. So he turns a second disciple who's from the cold north, and he says, I know, it's when the first shafts of sunlight glint off the snow and ice on top of the Himalayas, and you see the reflection of the sunlight off the snow and ice. That is when the night ends and the dawn begins. But the sage says, no, my son. It is when two travelers from the farthest ends of our land meet and embrace each other as brothers. And when they look up and they see that they sleep under the same sky and see the same stars. That is when the night ends and the dawn begins. We've had a... We've had many a dark night in our country's history. I've tried to answer this question today in a way that I hope will stay with you as you go forward to bringing India a new dawn in this century. Thank you, and Jehan.